because some of you are okay so we we are recording this session i want to make sure you guys have a chance to ask questions because that's one of the things that i have been getting some comments on so at the end i will leave a few minutes where i will stop the recording and you guys can feel free to ask questions um once again Thank you so much to UCLA, the Southern California Research and Education Center, um, UCLA, UCI, and NIOSH, who have put together this program in order to bring this information out to you guys. So I'm very grateful to Lindsay and Annie. Uh, they are always here for me and for you guys to answer questions, to get to your um, CEUs, to get to the, the credits that you need, and to also help you with your, your certificate programs. So ask more questions. They're great. Email them. Ask them how you can get enrolled in their certificate programs. Um, next year, it's promising. We're having more instructors. If I'm if I'm right, Lindsay, and hopefully more classes, different uh, on site, even in person, so you get hands on, real. Um, Let's get to see how this works out with respiratory protection, for example, which is really important so that you can bring it back to your facilities and teach people how to really use and wear a respirator and get some input from the people that know how to marry that portion of what does the regulation say and what does the practical aspects of the regulation say? So my name is Alva Vasquez. I see some of your names. Thank you for coming back to us every single first uh, Friday of the month. I apologize so that this class was moved one more uh, week, week uh, or this is the second Friday. It's very rare that we move it. It's just because of, you know, how it is with health issues, family issues, et cetera. But I appreciate you being here today. Uh, the topic is about the Injury and Illness Prevention Program 2022, and the reason behind it is because this is where I'm seeing right now a lot of citations. Uh, unfortunately, there are not, not, not documents that are updated to the 2022 out uh, in the public record, so I have some of the outdated or past documents to show, but it will look the same. The reason being, they do not become a public record until the citation and the documents are sent to employers. And inspectors have six months from the moment they show up at your facility to actually issue the notification to cite you. Um, so the injury and illness prevention program becomes your most important piece of information that will be asked from you when an inspector shows up. So I cannot stress the importance of this. We had last week, was last week or two weeks ago, we had an actual eight hour class that focused entirely on how to make this program an effective program. And why is this so important? It's because this will be, well, we'll tell the actual inspector from OSHA, we call them COSHOs, which stands for Compliance Safety, Compliance Officers for Safety and Health. And COSHOs will show up at your facility, uh, mostly when it's hot, they will show up because of heat illness, because it's an emphasis program here in California. And if I say emphasis program, that means California has made the decision to allocate more resources towards that particular hazard. So even for those inspectors or area uh, co-shows that normally don't go out there for outdoor places of employment or warehousing, because a lot of people die because of heat in warehouses, and they know this, they will allocate those people to go out and investigate and find out uh, if employers are doing the right thing. And once they're there, they will immediately ask for the injury and illness prevention program. Another aspect that is bringing inspectors to your workplace is the lockout tagout um, regulation. For those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, that's when you, talk, when you work with machinery and equipment. Machinery and equipment that needs to be serviced, repaired, and the most common one that causes the most trouble, unjammed. Anything that gets jammed at your facilities, you have to have a specific step-by-step -step process. It's called lockout tagout. Lock out, tag out. Some of you uh, have it in, in the form of work instructions. And I love the name work instructions because that means as a worker, I cannot do this job. I cannot unjam this machine unless I have specific written out instructions on how to do this so I stay safe. So I'll, I'll talk to you about a couple of the things that I've seen, how we're fighting this um, uh, inspector's um, notification to classify violations as serious and what my point of view is on that when they send you this notification and what to do. So here are our, uh, as always, my disclaimer, right, is I am not an attorney. I'm a consultant and I've been visiting your workplaces since 2011. And I also travel the United States because there's different programs in the, in the nation for different states. So um, 
if you have any questions or you're in serious trouble because someone got hurt at your facility, uh, serious injury or death, make sure you consult with an attorney. I'm also not practicing any of the healing or um, professions. I'm not a nurse. And if we talk about anything that has to do with ergonomics or issues of health, it's from the perspective of safety always. So today I wanna make sure you guys see some of the top citations related to the injury illness prevention program. And once again, this is a regulation that has been in place since 1991 and still employers don't know how to make it effective. So what does that mean? It means every single one of you on this call have already a document that is called the injury illness prevention program. And I don't know, but I want to see by a show of hands, raise your hand if you've read your injury illness prevention program in the last six months. And if you don't know how to raise your hand, just ask Lindsay in the chat. <laughs> okay, so I do have one person who says, I have read my IIPP. I know what it looks like. I've read it. So it's important that you write down as a to-do that you, most of you have everything electronic now because we want to save the trees, right? So we don't want, <laughs> we're going paperless. We're not stuck in the past. Take a look at that piece of paper, the Injury and Illness Prevention Program, and make sure that you know that it has all of the elements required by the regulation because they can pick on any of those elements to tell you that your program is not effective. And I'm going to get there. I also want you to know what are the two different methods to start implementing what Cal OSHA calls the effective program. So top citations and what, what would constitute an effective program. And last but not least, what does a document request look like from Cal OSHA? Because that's the first document you will see from them. No matter what kind of inspection you get, the moment they get to your facility, that's what you will see, a document request. They give you a few days. They do allow for an extension. And I always tell my clients, ask for an extension because it gives you a chance to My IPP, right? <laughs> it's not really, you're not really familiar with it's your first assigned you. to safety. And I keep saying, Alba, your, okay. Thank you. your connection went out a little bit. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Okay, but you're good now. Okay, okay. So I hope I'm better. I'm, I'm, I'm better now. Okay, so what is an IIPP and how it works? The first thing you got to do is read the regulation. Why do I want you to read the regulation? It's because although it will cure your insomnia and put you to sleep, it will also make you familiar with the eight elements of the reg. And they're not listed as eight. Some of you could say it's only seven. Some of you could say it's nine. I say eight and I'll tell you why. So I'm going to take you guys to the actual regulation. So this is your main regulation, the main regulation that you need to be aware of and that you will need in order to put together an effective injury and illness prevention program. Okay, so now you can see my actual internet page and you can see that the regulation section 3203 and I always go through subchapter 7 general industry safety general industry safety orders group 1 physical condition structure orders that's where you have a actual rule and a mandate to put together an injury illness prevention program and there are several elements that you need to be aware of so first of all it says that it needs to be effective, which means you have to implement it, maintain it, and ensure that it is effective. That means put it in writing, but then make sure it happens in practice. Number one, number one element of the program, identification of the person or persons with authority and responsibility. So this is what we usually call the responsibility element. Someone is in charge of safety. It has to be, you have to put either a job title or the name of a person. Usually, I would advise you put a job title, but make sure that the person knows, hey, you're in charge of administering this IIPP. And a lot of you don't want that responsibility, but you're not alone. You should designate 
a, an administrator or a responsible person and under that person, a backup person and a team of people that helps. Now, I don't advise that you put all of that into your IIPP, but I do want you to have that even if it's a separate document that you actually let them know. Listen, I'm the administrator of the IIPP, but each supervisor will implement each portion of the safety requirements. Okay, I, I hear some background noise. So make sure you guys are, if you want, uh, by the way, if you want to ask a question and you want to interrupt whatever I'm saying, I'm happy with that because it does make it uh, a good for a good interaction. Uh, or if you want to leave your question at the end, like I said, we're going to make sure there's a Q&A session. Uh, the next thing is after the, the actual responsibility would be a system for communication, right? So it says, oh, no, actually com comply. So that means compliance. A system for ensuring that employees comply. So compliance is element two. Element number one, responsibility. Element number two, compliance. What does that mean? It means the stick and the carrot kind of concept. Stick and the carrot, meaning we have to have a way to ensure that they feel incentivized to do things the way you're asking them to do them. What are you doing for them in order to say, hey, no, I, I want to follow the safe practices. I don't want to take sure, I don't want to take shortcuts. I want to make sure I review the policies. I want to make sure I go to training. What are you doing to incentivize? And there are, there are some incentive programs that we put in place that are not good or practical. For example, um, when we put those signs that says this company has been zero days without any uh, incidents or accidents. And the reason, and some of you, if you've seen that in your facilities where it says zero, uh, zero days uh, with accidents, or you are counting the many days in the year, and you incentivize people by saying, if we stay with zero days without an incident or injury, we're going to have a pizza party, or we're going to, you know, whatever you tell them you're going to do if they stay like that for three months, for the quarter, for six months, whatever your goal is. It's a bad way. It's, it's a poor incentive program. And the reason being, People don't want to be the one who breaks the record. They don't want to be pointed out as the crybaby who had to get injured and had to report an injury. And therefore now, you know, coworkers look at you like, I can't believe you did this. It would have been better if you didn't say anything. Uh, so it, it's not a good system because it encourages people not saying anything under reporting. So not a good thing. You have to have a good incentive program. You can ask me more about that later. But compliance also means you have disciplinary action in place, a policy, and that you actually have records. And this is the important part. So you may want to write it down. Have disciplinary action records on different employees for the last 12 months or so. If a kosher shows up because someone got seriously injured or someone came down with some illness, let's say if you're in nursing, uh, someone is having some of uh, those uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, or even an aerosol transmissible disease, and they reported it to OSHA as a serious um, illness. Why? Because they ended up being hospitalized, right? Not under observation, but they actually had to have some hospital time. That's a reportable injury to Cal OSHA. Somebody should have picked up the phone and call and let them know that this was at work injury or illness. And now they are, they have the option to open an inspection and even show up and present you with a document request. One of the things that they will ask is when people fail, for example, to have personal protective equipment on their faces to prevent the transmission of aerosol transmissible disease. Did you do anything? How many of those counseling um, documents do you have? Counseling for safety or warnings, written warnings. So disciplinary action is huge in order to make this second element, compliance, an effective part of your injury illness prevention program. So when I say effective, I'm giving you an example right now. It means make sure that you're ensuring compliance by incentivizing and also by disciplining. Now, Give me those records. That's what the inspector wants to see, the records. Let me see what you've really done regarding compliance. That's how I'm going to see if your program is actually effective or not. Because they expect that during the past 12 months, you've actually had somebody mess up, right? We're not perfect. That's exactly what's going to happen. Someone is going to mess up and you have to document it. You have to have documentation that someone did not um, wear their gloves when they should have 
that someone did not utilize needleless devices when they should have, that someone did not use their assistive device to lift the person from bed to chair because they were in a rush, they were in a hurry, they didn't ask for a teammate because this type of move was required as a team lift. So now you can see how these policies are many times in place at your places of, of employment, but employees sometimes take shortcuts. They don't want to do it because it takes a little longer. It stops them from their flow or they just have to, uh, they have a very rushed day or, or shift, all of those things. So those are the examples that I wanted to make sure I brought to you. I'm going to go back to my um, PowerPoint to share with you a little bit more. So those are the eight elements. I want to finish the eight elements real quick. I'm not going to explain each and one of them the way I did compliance and responsibility, but I do want to finish the eight elements. Communication is the number three. Okay, communicating with employees. And that will bring in, you know, vocabulary. How are you training? What kind of postings? Do you have all the postings required by law? How often you meet, meet for tailgate meetings? So in order to be effective, let's say they get to you and they ask for training records and you don't have them. Huge issue, huge issue. And let me see someone. Is the correct definition of reportable injuries what triggers an injury to be reportable, non-reportable? Okay, so I'll give you the exact link, okay, because that was the question about what is the reportable injury. I'll give you the exact link for you to study that because there is um, Kalosha. If you go to Kalosha homepage, you will see in the actual how to report an injury or what's new with Kalosha, you will see the actual updates. Let's see how the definition of a serious injury and illness changed and someone in your facility should be in charge of keeping updated with Kalosha. Your safety director or the administrator of your IIPP should be reviewing the updates from Kalosha just the way I just did them. And then here you say, how have the definitions of serious injury and illness and exposure changed with regard to immediate reporting to Kalosha? So that will give you the definition of what's reporting uh, to Kalosha. What is a reportable injury to Kalosha? So remember, there's different definitions of what a reportable injury is uh, under first aid, insurance purposes. So let's make sure we're wearing the right hat. If we're talking about just Kalosha, what do you report when an injury or illness occurs? Number one, inpatient hospitalization, regardless of the length of time. And we're talking about things that are work-related or you suspect them to be work-related or you do not know if they're work-related. Why? Because uh, for COVID, for example, sometimes people have a immune system that is not up to par. They don't know exactly where they got COVID and they may tell you, I don't know, it might've been at work. And they end up being hospitalized you have the obligation to report to Kalosha. So inpatient hospitalization, regardless of length, length of time for other than medical observation or diagnostic testing, amputation, loss of an eye, serious degree of permanent disfigurement. And you can take a look at the actual reg, but this is a fast and quick way to answer that question, okay? So I hope it did, because that's a reportable to Kalosha. So under, and by the way, those calls trigger inspections and those inspections trigger a, a COSHA going to your facility and handing you a document request. The first thing they're going to ask you for is the injury and illness prevention program. So under this regulation, you're required to maintain it, make sure that it's effective. effective. And lately, one of the emphasis uh, starting 2021 was to make sure it's available to employees. So you have to put in writing how you're making it available to your employees. That's why I, I put it in bold letters. So some of you say, well, you know, I have iPads. My employees have iPads and they can all just click in the safety folder and access the actual IIPP. Well, make sure that you have also instructed your employees on how to operate that iPad. Because if you have a level of literacy, uh, let's say in an area of your facility, janitorial um, workers or any of the workers with a level of literacy where they're not comfortable with an electronic device and they don't know how to access it, you're in trouble right there, okay? So available is one of the updates for Kalosha. It's gotta make sure that you have it in writing. Some of you have said that you put it in binders at each of the locations and that's perfectly fine as long as it is there and it is current. The regulation does not require that you update this program every year. Do I, 
actually recommend it? Yes, because people leave, uh, job um, titles change, or even equipment and, and major renovations occur in your facilities and parts of your IIPP even added programs for training. Let's say that you added a respiratory protection program last year. You should point out that you're also the list of required training uh, subjects or topics should include now your, your respiratory protection program, for example. So that's why it's so important that you review it every year so that in order that it stays um, effective. The next thing is for some of you that have, have never visited the Cal OSHA website, I already showed it to you briefly, make sure that uh, you find the regulation the way I did. You can just Google it or um, go to the updates or just click in the search box for the actual website uh, injury illness prevention program. It'll take you there. This is part of that page that I just showed you in regards to the important Cal OSHA updates. When you click on cannabis industry, health and safety, you will see that because it was legalized, a lot of the actual uh, regulations of a lockout tagout, uh, slip, trip, and fall, and uh, housekeeping issues, uh, compressed gases applied to this industry. And because it was before, it was not legal. And now this industry um, is it's coming up <laughs> to the light or has been in the, in the recent years. They don't have a lot of the safety programs up to par. So Kalosha wanted to highlight this is what you have to have in place. And it's very helpful to take a look at this. OSHA important updates. Uh, definitions to the serious injury analysis reporting, which I just visited for you, the COVID emergency temporary standards. Right now we have a version of the COVID uh, emergency standard that it is, um, it's, it's current since May 6th and it'll stay till December, the end of December. Permit requires for construction activities, recording, you can see what applies to you and click on that and you will have great information. So this is part of the responsibilities of that IIPP administrator. So don't forget, if you are the actual administrator of this program, you gotta get to look at those updates on a regular basis. So schedule it, please. For those of you that don't know where your IIPP is, or can't find it, and you're afraid OSHA is gonna show up and you don't have this document, Make sure you go through the actual publications for Calosha. And of course, consultants and firms, insurances, software, they can sell you these model programs. My only um, reservation is that there is a newer model program from Calosha, and you should just go with that one. It's very simple, very straightforward, and you shouldn't add more than what they have. Take a look at that, and you will get a copy of these slides because this link will take you straight to that. Um, we'll take you straight to the, the model programs and you will see that it says model injury and illness prevention program for non-high hazard employers or for high hazard employers, right? This is just a screenshot of what that was. Let me take you to the actual document um, just so that you have a idea of how it looks like and why I think it's so important that you follow it. Here it is. So just take out the word model anytime you find it, but I would leave, I would erase this, right? Because it's, it's a fillable template. So erase that part, but it says anything in red, that means enter your information, make it specific to you. Don't leave it just like this, just and for heaven's sakes, if this is what you're going to use as your IPP, read the, the whole thing, read it, make sure it is really particular to your place of employment. Um, Leave the Kalosha insignia on it so that they see that you use their January 2021, which is their most recent update to the IIPP. And then you go into the name of the company. Here it is, how simple it is just to put a name or a job title and the name of your company. Like I said, there's no need to explain anything further. The reason you don't want to explain anything further is because the more you promise and under deliver, the more citations will come your way. So if you're saying we do have a great system for compliance and in this system, we actually, for any time we don't see a compliance with uh, any of the safety regulations, we give a counseling session and we have this form where supervisor and employee will just sign that they took a couple minutes to talk about the, the, the lack of PPE, for example. And you do not have that in place. And there's nothing in the last 12 months to show that you're actually putting in practice what you're promising in this IIPP. You will be cited for having an ineffective IIPP. So you, you will receive your document saying um, regulatory violation, uh, 3203, IIPP, non-effective, 
uh, employee employer basically is promising they're going to do counseling for safety for a few minutes, supervisor, they, there's no records of such a thing in the past 12 months. So you wouldn't want to be in that position. You want to make sure that you do have uh, whatever you're promising here, that you will do it. By the way, I just showed you how to take a look at the regulation because one of the most common questions I get is, oh, should I check mark just one? Should I check mark two or three? Or should I just check everything? Okay, the answer is in the actual regulation. So the regulation will tell you whether or not they want you to check mark three. And if they're giving you all of these as an example, and you can't find that, that each of those is a requirement in the reg, then it's up to you if you want to add it as part as what you do. Okay. So that's how you would know how many to check mark. Same for communication, same for the rest of the actual elements. Here is a table that they put here for hazard assess. And now one of the things that I want to make sure you know after today and you write it as a to-do. You have no way to prove to Kalosha that you actually do internal audits, internal inspections, you will be in trouble because that's one of the most sought after documents by Kalosha. They may not ask you for the disciplinary records. They may not ask you for you know, anything else, your, your incentive program, they may not. But they will for sure ask you each time this year, every time OSHA has shown up to any place of employment, they ask for records of internal audits and hazard assessment. So that's a to-do for you on this call today. You have to have records of how you assess hazards on a daily basis, on a quarterly basis, on a biannual basis. Whatever you say you're doing, you got to have records. So competent observer, that means the name of the person that is in charge of doing the audit for that area, because he has to be a knowledgeable person. You can't have someone that doesn't know anything about lathes and the machinery you have in your facility inspect that area. And at the same time, you wouldn't have a, a person that is not knowledgeable in the nursing practices at your facility do an audit on that area, because you want to observe workers doing their job, not just taking a look at the physical location, not just taking a look at the actual uh, facilities, but taking a look at how they do the job. Just sit there and observe, video record them for ergonomics purposes, for uh, purposes of uh, safe work practices. Are they really doing things the way you taught them, the way you trained them to do it? And if not, a simple note in your documentation and how you corrected that hazard. When, how, and who. That's what's super important. So married to this hazard assessment or your internal audit is the documentation of how you went about correcting it. Who corrected it? At what time, what date? What did you do in the interim, right? Short-term, long-term. I like adding here. Um, so I have the competent observer, the area, and the frequency. So that way... You do not have to put here again the frequency, right? Uh, accident incident exposure investigation. It's very brief. As a matter of fact, when you read the regulation, you go back to your Googling 3203 IIPP, it'll tell you have a process for incident investigation. That's all the regulation says. Okay. So, mind you, that's all the regulation says. That's why we call these regulations performance based. But it is so important that we actually put something in writing. And this one is actually more complicated than you think, because for those of you that are um, assigned incident investigators, in case anything happens at your facilities, you got to be there. You have to fill out the actual reports. You know that there's actual techniques to find out the root causes, uh, to first gather all the information that will gather the, the actual sequence of events, get to your surface causes, contributing factors, and then your root causes. If you have a doubt on how to do this, and if you are the actual administrator of the program, and you are the one doing the incident investigation, don't get all these headaches yourself. Get the support of your supervisors. As a matter of fact, talk to HR, find out if in their description of um, job descriptions, they have included that they, have, they will be trainers, that they will have safety responsibilities and they have to be good communicators and that they will also be assigned to do incident investigation, right? So that they get training and they know that this was part of their job description. That's what you want. Then hazard correction, like I explained, who, what, and when did you correct training and instructions? These are elements that are required, right? 
required. Training and instruction is the next element. You have to have a program for training of all workers. So there's different levels. Some of you have seen that I have prepared matrices for you. Some of you do it on a calendar um, format because it's quarterly, because however you do it, make sure you have a list of what are the training topics uh, and that you actually have supervisors receive this type of training and please receive this type of training. And I'll give you, I'll give you an example of forums and how to do that. Uh, employee access to the IPP is what was added. Like I said, that this is why these are the updates and this is why this is a safety update webinar because you have to make sure a lot of your IIPPs as you are on this call, your injury and illness prevention program doesn't have in writing how employees access this program. This is now mandated, okay? So make sure that you do write down here how this is accomplished. If it's iPad, or a binder, or if it's that you give everyone a copy as soon as they get to you, when, how, et cetera. But they give you a good example on how to do this here. And then record keeping is another element. How do you keep records? So they give you a couple of categories. They're a little bit confusing. So if you have a problem deciding which one to pick, give me a call. But basically it gives you a chance to say, well, we keep records for one year. Or no, we only keep him for the time of employment. Or you know what? We're less than 10 employees. So you have to read this and check mark which category you fall under. By the way, if you notice here at the top, you have IIPP model known high hazard. So you have to find out whether or not you're a high hazard industry by Cal OSHA or non high hazard. So if you're in healthcare, for example, you will find out that some of you are high hazard, considered high hazard, and some of you are not. For the most part, small... Um, Clinics, family, practitioners, you know, those, those smaller type of settings are not considered high hazard, but anything in the uh, skilled nurse facilities, uh, psychiatric care, all of those will be classified as high hazard. Manufacturing, high hazard. Uh, retail, non-high hazard. So you have to make sure that you know how you're classified. For that, you have a code, the NAICA code. Here is a sample of the hazard assessment and correction record that will, they will ask for you. So if OSHA ever shows up at your place, you have to learn, this is my program. You give them a copy of your IIPP because they want to know how you are doing safety at your places of employment under all of the elements. And then they want to see how you corrected the hazards that you found the, under those inspections. Um, so it says, would you recommend giving the IIPP to all employees at the time of employment on, or when the IIPP is updated? Both. So a lot of my clients have a review of the IIPP at the moment they become new workers. So they're in their new worker orientation. Uh, explanation of the IIPP is part of the, the new worker orientation topics. And when your IIPP is updated, you know, it's a good idea. Yeah, sure. Do go ahead and do it. But what I do is I tell my, my employers just, once a year, schedule a review, meaning that once a year you're reviewing your IPP and you're communicating it. So it's, it, it doesn't slip their minds. Every January, they have scheduled IIPP review and IIPP communication with employees. So you have, let's say, a training, all hands training session for 30 minutes every month. During the January month, you add the actual explanation of the IPP. It could be brief or it could be the 30 minutes if you haven't done it ever, right? You haven't done it ever, ever in the, in the past. You want to tell every one of your employees, you know, these are the elements. This is our promise for safety. That's basically it. But if it's just an update and you've done it with every single one of your new employees and you just want to tell them that you updated it, you just tell them what you updated. Something such as, you know, now from now on, we're going to have a safety suggestion, su suggestion box. And it's a red box located at such and such room at the break room or right by the bulletin board, something like that. Five minutes will suffice. Just make sure you document it. Where? In your roster. Your roster should be a document that looks a little bit better than this. There's a roster here. Uh, in the same model program that says employee name. And it also says uh, dates, type of training and trainers. So what I want to make sure that you also record is the time. So did I put something here? No, I didn't add it. But my roster looks a little bit different. I have the language. I have the time start and time, time end or end time. And I also have... Uh, the actual outline. And in the outline, I will put what was discussed. For example, IPP review or update, five minutes. And then the rest would be lockout, tagout procedures, 
30 minutes or 45 minutes or 30 minutes Spanish, 30 minutes English. So that's super important because now you've recorded a lot more information with the names and the signatures of the workers. So whenever a, a, a Cal OSHA inspector shows up, your records are going to be in top shape and very well documented. And you can actually defend any citation or notice of violation much better when you have something like this in place. So I'm going to get into a couple of tips for you and how to defend that and what not to give them and what to give them in a second. All right, so I wanted to visit that model program and just make sure that you know if you're a high hazard or a non-high hazard type of employer. That's easy to Google if you just go into the list of high hazard employers for Calosha and you will see it for 2021. There's not an updated one just because um, uh, they go by fiscal year. So the latest one we have is at 2021. All right, real life. Okay, so yes, I did ask, uh, I did write down in my, learning objectives, something about real life case scenarios. How is it that this will look like? Proposed penalty is a 54,000 uh, proposed penalty to, and by the way, your name is splattered on the Cal OSHA page, on the OSHA, federal OSHA now has a specific establishment search. The establishment search is old. What's new there is that Cal OSHA now um, relates all of the summaries, the 300 log, uh, which is just a summary form, to the federal database. So Cal OSHA's inspections found the records through the Fed site. So if you didn't know, go today, the company, and look at this the establishment search under the... All but cutting out. I don't know if you can hear us. In search. Yes, I can hear you. I okay, saw a note there. Out. So I hope it's getting a little better. All right. Yeah, all right. Sure. Um, okay. So I was saying that what's important is for you to look up the history, the safety history of your company with OSHA. You're going to go to the OSHA website, the federal website, establishment search. So go to the establishment search, put the company that you're going to work for, the one you're working for, the one that they just assigned you to be the administrator of the IIPB, and look at your history. That's important even for any appeals process in the future. It will really matter what's your history with Cal OSHA. In this case, this particular company uh, had serious citations issued because of their failure to implement and ensure the implementation of their IIPP, of the required elements. What does that mean? The inspector is looking at each of those elements that we just reviewed together to make sure that you wrote it down, how you're going to do it, and that you're actually doing it in practice, in real life, that people know how to communicate with you. That if you have a open door policy for communication of safety matters, that employees actually feel comfortable enough to go up to their supervisor with concerns, that it has happened in the past, that you have proof that it has happened. Uh, the next one, oh, by the way, they do cite you for the failure to implement your IIPP, and then they go on to why they were there. And in this case, it had to do with lockout tagout, right? Because it had to do with uh, hazardous reciprocating and running actions of the counterweight. So these are moving parts where a person can be seriously injured or hurt. So now they go into lockout tagout regulations. So you will have citations and violations and proposed penalties under both regulations, which is IIPP 3203 and the lockout tagout regulation as well. So another uh, example, this is a $200,000 fine issued to Henkel Corporation for failure to follow its own injury and illness prevention program. And this wording is straight from their documents. So you put a program, which only I only had one raised hand of one of you here today that said, I have read my IPP. I know where it is and I'm familiar with it. So for the rest of you, you're going to read it today because you don't want to be cited for failure to follow your own IIPP. Because it says here, you know, they said that they actually identify hazards on a regular basis. You put it here that on a, uh, on a quarterly schedule, you go out there and you divide your company by sections or areas and you put a competent person in charge of reviewing these areas. 
and they will document the hazards found and how they corrected them. But in this case, there was a mixer that didn't have a guard. And, you know, the investigation revealed the company continued to operate the mixer despite knowing that the partial guard on the mixer exposed the workers to the dangerous moving parts. One of the serious violations issued against Henkel was for the company's failure to ensure that sleeves on employees' coveralls fit tightly so clothing would not get caught in machinery. And you go, I can't believe this. So I'm even... I'm even in charge of, uh, some of you say, I'm not going to babysit them. I'm not going to tell them, you know, you have to wear this tight clothes because they're going to get caught. They know it's common sense. I'm sorry, but common sense doesn't work. Common sense is a superpower and common sense is not in the regulation, but in the regulation, specifically with machine guarding and lockout tagout, you will find that it is prohibited. One of the prohibited practices is wearing loose clothing near moving parts when machinery could get you into the machine and you could get hurt or injured. Uh, another of the issues is hair. A lot of the workers that have longer hair, they need to put it back. They need to make sure it's out of the way. Uh, more on the citations. I gave you a link for you to review. Right now they changed it from notable citations because now um, federal OSHA, like I said, through establishment search allows you to look up the documents. And in this case, uh, the notable citations page was changed to COVID related citations and penalties. So the name of companies that have been cited lately for COVID, uh, it's there. And you will see on the, the actual uh, page that you have the regulation that was violated and the amount they were cited for. So th this is good for you to get an idea. You find bagel shops, hospitals, machinery and equipment manufacturers, et cetera, on the list of people that have been cited. And what is the first document that they asked for? The IIPB. And then what? Whatever document is related to the violation or injury that the worker suffered under your supervision. Uh, some of the effectiveness questions that I, I want you to go through when you review your IPP, when you sit down in your in front of your desk and you review, I want you to make sure that you go through, do I really have someone who is the administrator? How is this accomplished in your facility? And what were the actions that you have at this point to make sure this happens? Because I want to, this is the question, are employees made aware of who is the person with authority and responsibility for their IIPP program? So it seems like a complicated question, but it, all it means is go out there on the floor today, go out there to your nurses, go out there to your uh, warehouse workers and ask them, do you know who's in charge of safety? Do you know who administers the actual, who's the director or the administrator of the IIPP? And if they don't know, you're in trouble. <laughs> So it means make it, make it something that it is plausible, something that they actually know on a daily basis. Oh, if I have a safety concern, I actually write it here in this form and I deposit it in the box. Or if it's something urgent, supervisors need to know immediately. Uh, my direct supervisor is so-and-so, and he says that he, I can walk into his office. I actually have his cell phone number for emergency. Boom, perfect. Perfect. That's what they want to hear. That's what uh, an effective IIPP would call for. Uh, compliance. Are employees recognized for performing safe and helpful work practices? That's something you got to ask yourself today. Do you have a program where they are actually recognized for performing safely? We give gift cards. How often is this really, have you actually evaluated the efficacy of this program or is it encouraging underreporting, right? And I have a question here. So let me see what that is. What would count as a COVID-related citation? Uh, there is a couple of those. So you want to go to the actual uh, web page of notable citations on the Kalosha page. You will see two of the most common ones are not calling Kalosha because someone contracted COVID at the workplace. They were hospitalized for it. Let's say they were hospitalized for two days and you never called Kalosha to let them know. That is one of the main COVID related citations. Another one is... Um, a common one would be aerosol transmissible disease for hospitals and um, nurse uh, skilled facilities or even ambulatory centers. Anything that is healthcare is getting nailed one after another for the lack of an actual program where they're implementing measures to prevent the transmission. So you will see a lot of the transmissible disease. Um, 5199 is the actual regulation. You will see that uh, because they showed up for COVID. Okay, very good questions. Are employees dis dis 
discipline for performing unsafe or unhelpful work practices. How is this accomplished at your place of employment? The actions required. So if you don't have a good disciplinary action, how would you know? If in the last 12 months, you have nobody who has gotten, you know, um, called for a counseling session or given a warning for some unsafe related practices, then you do not have an actual effective IIPB. Okay, so what are the actions required on your part? And you have to write them down. Next question is, when you're training employees on the IPP during orientation or after IIPP updates, how detailed do you need to be aside from providing them with a copy of the policy? What else would you recommend? I, I do a page. I actually give them a page where I put these are the eight elements, responsibility, compliance, communication, hazard assessment, hazard correction, incident investigation, um, uh, training and instruction, record keeping, uh, and access to the program. Mind you, if you have a safety and health committee, you could also want to put that, put that there, that you have a safety and health committee. There are some requirements. If you have an actual safety and health committee, you can review them in the reg. But a simple page listing all of the elements and then going over them quickly with them during the all hands training session or just letting them know on that one through eight, the name of the administrator, compliance, uh, make sure that you bring concerns to such and such. So make it practical. So each of the elements, just list it. You can see how this can fit in half a page. Eight elements and a quick tip on how to accomplish that. Compliance or communication. Report any concerns immediately to your immediate supervisor. As simple as that. And remind them that you have safety suggestion boxes, right? Great question. Great question. Are employees given training or retraining? Uh, hazard assessment. Do you have actual training records, right? Those your organization's periodic, ins periodic inspections, the words periodic inspections are straight from regulation. And you may ask, oh goodness, what's a periodic inspection? Does that mean daily? Does that mean quarterly? You make the decision depending on the hazardous conditions at your facility and how fast they evolve. So for construction workers, they do hazard assessments every day. And I also do quarterly inspections we walk the floor, we go to their field locations, write it down. All right. Uh, awesome. No, thank you for the questions. This is great. Hazard assessment, the document. So last but not least, this is what it looks like, guys. You receive something like this. And every time they're going to ask you for the legal name, the business license, they're going to ask you for the number of employees nationwide and at your location. And then they're going to ask you for Voila, your injury and illness prevention program in writing, all of your safety inspection records, all of your uh, employee training records, all of your OSHA logs for the past three years, and the 301, the incident report, if it's related to a specific incident for a specific name or employee. And if you have a dual multi-employer, oh, this is key. How many of you, by a show of hands, have actual staffing agencies providing you with temp workers? Wow, many of you. Okay, two uh, more. Okay, so more people raising hands. <sighs> I cannot stress the importance that today, after today's webinar, you review your contracts and you make sure that every single one of those, so I have more people actually giving input in this regard. Take a look at your contracts. They will ask you for your actual contract and they will ask you, what are the actual layers? And this is, this is the key here. Layers of protection implemented by your company so that any temp worker does not get hurt. Mind you, there is an emphasis program nationwide to protect temp workers, temp agency workers. So any staffing agencies are under the magnifying glass from OSHA because Temp workers are new workers every time. And I think we had this talk like three months ago and all I discussed was temp workers. So it's huge. If you, if you want to review this, go to, I think it's, it probably was the July or one of those months, the webinar. Review them. There's a link to, Lindsay always sends you a link to all of the past uh, webinars. And I did one only on temp workers because it's such an important topic. And then they will ask you for the incident. This, as you can tell, this is very recent, August, 2022. And they will ask you for everything regarding your incident investigation. So take a class on incident investigation and put those people that need the class, enroll them in a class. We have an incident investigation class 
eight hour class in depth for those supervisors that you have assigned to do this for you. Because the records that they're asking you to provide are quite detailed. What are the root causes and what did you do to implement solutions and who took action? So this is very, very important. And last but not least, whatever was the, the injury or illness that occurred, they will ask you for that program. In this case it was the lockout tagout and the training records. When did you train them? Uh, what level of training, level of literacy, language, that is why it's so important you document what I told you to document on those rosters. Awesome. I'm going to, we have volunteers and then, oh gosh, yes, volunteers and interns. So anybody who is not coming from a staffing agency, volunteer workers here in California have a very interesting status. Volunteer workers will be considered your workers if, even if you don't pay them, they're not on payroll, but if you're actually giving them a some sort of recognition or a certificate, anything to recognize their work with you, even verbal sometimes, Kalosha, depending who you get, what the inspector you get, they will consider them as your employee and they will just take them as if they were your own payroll uh, employee, even if they're volunteers. So make sure that the training program, even for volunteers is tight, is good, is awesome. Talk to us, talk to Lindsay, send me an actual email if you need to know more about that training program and how it should be put in place. So I want you to take a look at this link on your own. It's like a 10 minute story, it's a great video, and it'll give you a little bit more on what to avoid and what to improve in your places of employment. I'll see you next month. I'm going to stop the recording and I want to see if anyone else, you guys were awesome. You asked questions.